Hello, um, welcome to uh, this webinar. I hope that you can all see and hear me. Always slightly nerve-wracking when um, we are doing this on Zoom, but I hope you can hear me. Um, my name is Tom Holland. I'm the president of the Stonehenge Alliance and wonderful to see so many of you um, attending this event. Uh, it's it's incredibly important. And um, appropriately, we have two brilliant speakers uh, tonight, um, absolute giants in their field. Um, we have Mike Parker Pearson, Professor of British Later His Prehistory at the Institute of Archaeology at UCL. Um, you know, what he doesn't know about the Stonehenge landscape, to be frank, is not worth knowing. Um, and we also have Phil Goodwin, who is the Emeritus Professor and Senior Fellow of Transport Policy again at UCL. So um, UCL coming in hard here, which is great to see. But just in case you're worried that it's um, just a couple of townies coming in, um, Phil is also uh, a fellow at the University of the West of England. Now, um, before they uh, speak, we're going to hear from Kate Freeman. Um, essentially, the Stonehenge Alliance would not exist without women called Kate. Um, so uh, at the end of this, we're going to hear from Kate Fielding, who um, essentially will be able to answer uh, any questions on um, the course of the campaign um, and the future of the legal uh, investigations that Michael Phil can't. Um, but before that, we're going to hear from Kate Freeman, who is going to give us a slideshow and talk us through exactly what the government's plan for the Stonehenge Tunnel actually means. Kate. Um, well, may I just add my welcome too from Stonehenge Alliance uh, as well. Um, as we know, the UK government has approved Highways England's plans for road widening through Stonehenge World Heritage Site. And the site is internationally recognised as a landscape without parallel for its remarkable survival of Neolithic and Bronze Age archaeology. I will now present a, just a rapid overview of the road scheme itself, just to give a context to what's being discussed. The single carriageway you see here will be widened to a dual carriageway with a short tunnel to form part of the new A303 expressway. Travellers approaching from London and the southeast along the A303 will no longer be able to see this uplifting view when the tunnel is created. This map shows the World Heritage Site outlined in grey as the boundary. The green shaded bit denotes the land owned by the National Trust. Single lane lengths of the A303 would be changed to a dual carriageway. A twin bore tunnel about three kilometres long would run south of the Stonehenge, covering about 60% of the width of the World Heritage Site. There would be a massive interchange at each end of the, at each side of the World Heritage Site boundaries. The Stonehenge scheme, though, is one of eight road improvement schemes between Stonehenge and the Southwest. Only three schemes have been funded. There is considerable doubt about the funding of the remaining five schemes. So, as Professor Phil Goodwin will explain further, the benefits of the Stonehenge scheme are rather doubtful. The tunnel portals will insert massive new infrastructure into the World Heritage Site. Here is the Eastern Tunnel Portal. Slip roads and a flyover pass close to the important Mesolithic site of Blick Mead on its way into the uh, World Heritage Site Tunnel. UNESCO particularly objected to the one kilometre length of cutting approaching the Western Tunnel entrance shown here, viewed from one of the bridges. The cutting would be a, just a massive gash between seven metres and ten metres deep. It would dwarf the tallest stone at Stonehenge. This is Stone 56, uh, which is just over six and a half metres tall. And Professor Parker Pearson may have something to say about the scale of damage that would be caused. Nearly one million tonnes of spoil will be excavated from the tunnel alone. It will need to be washed and a good deal of it will be spread over the nearby National Nature Reserve of Parsonage Down 
as well as being used for landscaping the Winterbourne Stoke bypass. One of the main objectives of this scheme is to conserve and enhance the World Heritage Site, but obviously this would not happen. Finally, I want to make a comment on the decision-making process. More than 200,000 objectors from 146, 147 different countries have signed our petition asking for the road scheme to be reconsidered. Objectors like ourselves, who took part in the six month examination of the scheme, had to plough through hundreds of complex documents and plans. The independent panel of examiners concluded that the scheme would cause irreversible harm to the World Heritage Site and recommended its refusal. The Secretary of State's decision to approve the scheme is being legally challenged by Save Stonehenge World Heritage Site, a limited company that was specially created. 80,000 is being raised to cover the cost of the judicial review later this month, but more might be needed if there should be an appeal. How democratic is such an adversarial scheme? The role of Stonehenge Alliance is to support the legal challenges and goodness me, everyone has rallied round. And so I'd like to take this opportunity to warmly thank everyone who has supported the cause, supported World Heritage and is fighting for the next generation. Back to you, Tom. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, I mean, every time I see those slides and you've shown them to me before, they strike a chill to the heart. I won't deny it. Um, let's hear now from uh, Professor Mike Parker Pearson. Um, no better person to tell us um, why the, the road scheme that Kate has just been demonstrating and illustrating, why it would be so damaging in archaeological terms. So, Mike, Thanks very much for coming here. Hugely grateful. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Tom. Right, now let's, uh, this should be setting up. Um, I want to start off with a series of questions about um, uh, the archaeology and uh, uh, based on some of the questions already come in, what's so special about the World Heritage Site? Why should we oppose the scheme? What do we know about the archaeology that would be lost? And isn't the archaeology, in fact, all going to be recorded before the road is constructed? And finally, why are some archaeologists actually in favour of the scheme? So to start off, why is, what is so special about the World Heritage Site? And of course, it's not just Stonehenge. It's the fact that this is a landscape packed with many impressive standing monuments, earthen monuments in particular, but also below ground there are um, not just hundreds but thousands of, uh, in fact millions of, of archaeological artefacts and, and other remains. Uh, and hardly a year goes by without some major discovery being made within the World Heritage Site that hits the international news. Uh, so of course this is um, a period of our history for which we have no written records and consequently the remains themselves are the only source of information. So they are extremely precious because once they are gone, they are gone for good. So why should we oppose the scheme? And uh, I think we have to remember that the World Heritage Site is within an area that's been massively encroached upon in the last um, uh, in the last 20 years so that it is uh, it is left really an island of conservation which is now the world heritage site so damaging development within that island really has to be resisted not just in the meantime but in perpetuity and unfortunately the, the, the road scheme uh, would indeed be the most extensive and damaging intrusion since the inscription of Stonehenge and Avebury together on the World Heritage Site list in 1986. Now, um, 
why we should oppose the scheme. Very simply, the tunnel's just not long enough. Um, 3.2 kilometers, the World Heritage Site is over five kilometers across at that point. It's a very out of date scheme, I'm afraid. I was there at English Heritage in the late 1980s when it was dreamed up. And here we are, what, 50 years later, or it will be 50 years later, uh, when it actually becomes operational. And I'm afraid the world has changed in so many ways that we're all aware of. And we have to wonder whether this really is the most suitable way of solving the problems that were perceived uh, in the 1980s. But from the archeology, span the most important thing is that that road line will ensure the complete destruction of 10 hectares of the World Heritage Site. Uh, most of it in the two uh, stretches outside of the western and eastern portals where the tunnel emerges, but also the very uh, corner in the top left, the northwest corner of the World Heritage Site is also going to be damaged by road building. And the thing about, as you saw from uh, Kate's uh, uh, drawings, uh, Kate's pictures, uh, it's a total destruction. Nothing will be left. Very different to all the excavations that have taken place for research in the World Heritage Site because everything there is simply put back. What isn't taken away for the museum actually goes back in the ground, broadly in the place where it came out of. So what makes um, Stonehenge so special is its archaeology and its earthworks, amongst other things. Uh, Kate's already made the point that the earthworks produced by the new scheme will completely dwarf those of the World Heritage Site itself. Um, as has already been mentioned, UNESCO recommended that the scheme be refused because of unacceptable damage to archaeology and negative impact on the landscape. And I'm afraid what this means is that in the eyes of the rest of the world, we're not properly looking after our particular bit of the planet's world heritage. And as uh, already explained, um, it's a decision that the Planning Commission was indeed refused only to be overturned. So what do we know about the archeology span that would be lost? And outside of the Western portal, um, evaluation work done by uh, contractors for the uh, for Highways England, uh, just looking at the plough soil, um, produced many thousands of artefacts. They're marked in this uh, map here in blue, so the, the sizes of the blobs indicate the densities of finds, mostly uh, strut flint and flint, art flint artefacts and flint tools. And the density is quite staggering, as you can see, in several areas. The road line uh, uh, is going to, is the area marked in green. And uh, what we know from this is that not only from their sampling, their 1% sample of that plough soil, we can reckon that there will be 381,000 prehistoric flint artifacts that will simply be destroyed, machined off before the actual uh, excavation of what's underneath the plough soil uh, takes place. We know from pre preliminary analysis of these finds that a good number of them are the remains of a settlement of the period that we call the Copper Age and the Early Bronze Age. So this would be an area of settlement for uh, people in prehistory that we know as the Beaker people and potentially this was their campsite when they were building the later stages of Stonehenge, stages three and four, uh, around 2000 BC. Outside the eastern portal, the densities are not quite so great, but the, the, the material recovered indicates that a lot of it derives from a period where we know very little, well, virtually nothing, I have to say, about settlement in the Stonehenge landscape. And this is from the early Neolithic. This is from the time that they were building long barrows. And in fact, the western 
route is passing through the densest cluster of Neolithic long barrows anywhere in Britain. So the settlement on the eastern side may be really very important. And again, an estimated 142,000 flint artifacts in the plough soil under the current proposals for investigation are simply going to be bulldozed. Now, further out um, uh, to the east, uh, Kate has already mentioned the Mesolithic site of Blickmead. Although it is physically not affected, there is concern that the uh, construction will uh, create or cause hydrological changes uh, in, uh, and lowering the water table. And uh, there is a worry that potentially organic deposits will be destroyed, that uh, materials that are in what deposits that are currently waterlogged may end up drying out and, and vanishing. And then finally, the, the third area, a much smaller one right up in the, the top uh, northwest corner, and relatively small damage, but nonetheless 20, 21,000 flint artifacts in the plough soil. Why are finds in the plough soil so important? And for those of us who work with prehistory, the time of Stonehenge is a time when actually people in the main weren't digging pits and ditches. They were living their lives on the ground surface, living in ephemeral houses and leaving few holes into the ground, the occasional grave, the occasional pit, maybe a, a tree hole where a tree had blown over, um, dumping material in there or, or, or using it as a working area. But most of their, their life and work was conducted on the surface. And of course, those layers have all been ploughed and all of the finds from those activities are in that plough soil. So we as archaeologists working within the World Heritage Site have known that to really understand what they were doing in these successive periods of prehistory from the Mesolithic through to the Bronze Age, you have to intensively sample that plough soil. And that means getting out there with shovels and spades and sieves and sieving the soil in metre squares to actually extract all of the artefacts, most of them are flint. And then you can plot out meter by meter the distributions to give you a picture of how people lived in that uh, landscape and how that, that changed through time. It's only through doing that really detailed work that you'll get that. Unfortunately, the uh, highways agency's approach is basically to strip and then record what has actually survived beneath the plough soil. And I'm afraid that is a minuscule proportion of the total remains. Now they were advised by the scientific committee that was appointed that equivalent standards should be applied to their work as to anyone else working in the World Heritage Site. They refused to do this. They considered it expensive and that it would take too long even though such a, such a process could be mechanised. And the result is that their sampling is only going, or they, they have prepared to pay for sampling that will only be minimal. And we will see half a million worked flints and other prehistoric artefacts lost without recovery. Worst of all, they're just going to be scattered over various parts of the World Heritage, Heritage Site, completely out of context. It's an unacceptable level of damage. So isn't the archaeology going to be recorded before the road is constructed? And indeed, the contract uh, company that, uh, that, that won the contract, Wessex Archaeology, they are indeed among the best archaeological contractors in the world, and I have every confidence they'll, that they'll do an excellent job if they can recruit enough staff. Uh, at the moment, we're somewhere around a thousand people short for working in commercial archaeology in Britain uh, due to the, the current political circumstances with Europe. But however good Wessex are, 
they can only do as much as they're allowed by the brief that they've been given by Highways England and by the, the heritage agencies who have been backing the scheme with the Department of Transport since the 1980s. So they're not going to be required to map or recover the majority of artifacts. They've so far recovered just 1%. They're talking about levels of percentage under 10, no more than 12 and a half percent for the rest of, of the work. But it shouldn't just be the plough soil. They're not prepared to fully, uh, highways are not prepared to ask for even all of the uh, sub surface features to be excavated, notably the tree hollows, which uh, may contain prehistoric remains. They're only going to look at just um, what 12 and a half percent of those, not the 100 percent that uh, many of us would recommend. And I'm afraid this is a flagrant breach of the usual standards that are met by archaeologists working in the World Heritage Site. Just to give you an example of what this means uh, in archaeological terms, uh, we were working on a number of sites between Stonehenge and the Western Portal uh, back in 2008. And I just take an example that I've worked at from just one of our trenches. Um, and it, it's 30 it was 30 metres long by 10 metres wide. So that's 301 metre squares. We hand dug and sieved every single square. That's what we were required to do by English Heritage and the National Trust. We required, um, uh, these are requirements that, the, that they didn't require the uh, Highways England to abide by. And I, I plotted out uh, the distribution of what we call the diagnostic tools. Now, these are the tools that are really important because these tell us the date of activity, and they're also diagnostic of the type of activities carried out. In this case, we're looking at Bronze Age scrapers, Bronze Age flint scrapers. And you can see uh, on the left hand side, we've got that we actually recovered seven of them within, within that area. Now, they constitute something like 2% of the total flint artifacts. So, if we were to sample at 16%, which is already higher than, the, than Highways England are prepared uh, uh, to ask the contractors to do, we wouldn't have found any of them. Even if we sampled a third of the area, we're only likely to find just one. And even well over 50%, at 64%, you can see, well, we pick up four. So uh, uh, only at that point are we beginning would we be beginning to get an idea of the diagnostic material and what it tells us about the date and the type of activities and of course scrapers uh, were used for, for cleaning hides amongst other things. So to finish off why are some archaeologists in favour of the scheme and there's no doubt that some think that a short tunnel is better than no tunnel and that we should just settle for the compromise close our eyes to the archaeological damage and bite the bullet. Some think it's entirely acceptable to lose over half a million flint artifacts in the plough soil. And I think it can only be because they don't understand that, that, uh, that, the, that, that, that there's valuable information on the spatial and chronological distribution of activities of the prehistoric people who lived in the landscape. Others say, well, we're going to do ooh, one, two, three, four percent sampling. It's not adequate because you have to do high percentage sampling to recover enough of those rare diagnostic artifacts, uh, as I explained with the previous slide. Some also say that short tunnels better than the longer but cheaper surface route going around the south of the World Heritage Site and avoiding it there. Um, but as far as we know, there is no significant archaeology in that area at all. And finally, and I think this is quite an important reason, there are archaeologists who don't want to rock the boat. They don't want to jeopardise their standing with the heritage agencies. Uh, they, you know, many of them are consultants and uh, they live in part off uh, 
of consultancy work. And we should also remember that none of the archaeologists who work for the heritage agencies who are working together with Highways England can even risk saying what they really think of this scheme. Uh, as you know, these organisations have been shedding jobs, uh, such as the National Trust and uh, an English heritage. Um, and I, I'm afraid it's very sad uh, that you know, their lack of concern, I think, undoubtedly is contributing further to our declining reputation for being able to protect not just our historic environment. Remember, this is the historic environment for the world. Anyway, I'll end there and uh, ask you back to Tom. Thank you very much, Mike. I mean, a, a brilliant exposition of, of why this scheme is disgraceful in archaeological terms and the sheer scale of the scandal that is threatening the reputation of this country as a place that cares about its, its past. Um, now, um, the scandal threatens is not just in terms of Britain's reputation as a country that cares about its archaeology, but also about the environment and its transport. So uh, I'm absolutely delighted now to uh, welcome Phil Goodwin to come and um, continue really the cataloging of, the, of this government's shame. Um, Phil, continue to shock us, please. Uh, well, <clears throat> thank you very much. I just want to make a few words of introduction before I start showing you slides. Uh, I've worked in transport appraisal as an academic and a local government official and a government advisor for over 40 years. And I'll come clean, I should tell you that I've been heavily critical of the many built-in biases, which I argue tend to favour the wrong projects. Traffic forecasts are wrong, mostly overestimated. Time savings are dubious. Traffic grows to offset the advantages of new capacity. The treatment of carbon is quite inadequate. The benefit cost ratios can be tweaked and don't reflect the strategic imperatives of climate change and equity and air quality. They don't take account of Brexit or COVID-19 or changes in government policy or priorities or better ways of solving transport problems. Maybe those issues will come up later in the discussion. But meanwhile, let me share my screen because I want to put all those criticisms aside. Uh, with um, with this project, even if we accept every word of the Highways England appraisal, and even if we accept the scheme and method and assumptions, the scheme as a road scheme still does not make sense. And even if we accept every single word of the method used to assess the heritage benefits of the, script, of the project, then it still doesn't make sense. And I want to explain what I mean using only the official numbers from uh, Highways England, the Department for Transport and the uh, Public Examination. First, let's think of it as a typical road scheme. Highways England tells us that its function is to provide more road capacity on the A303 because it's needed to cope with their own forecasts that traffic, mostly cars, will continue increasing every year for decades. They estimate that having the tunnel will have many benefits of which the biggest will be to save drivers time in quantities of seconds or minutes, but on millions of journeys spread over 60 years. The total value of that, they say, would be £252 million. Then there are some tax benefits, some claimed reduction in accidents. They're not worth very much. More reliable journeys, a little contribution to economic growth, very small, and a small amount to be taken off for pollution. They report out of that total benefits of £350 million, 
which sounds a lot. However, the total costs estimated at 1.2 billion pounds are over three times larger than the benefits. <clears throat> As a transport project, the scheme makes a public loss of 853 million pounds. But then if it was just a road building scheme, you wouldn't build a tunnel. Tunnels are far too expensive. And Cairo's England tell us that the reason for the tunnel is to take the damaging effects of traffic away from the World Heritage Site. And so they redo the calculations and they add a value of removing the road from the World Heritage Site um, in terms of the quality of the environment. That's a very big, large figure, 955 uh, uh, million pounds, nearly a billion pounds. Um, uh, and it gives total benefits of 1.3 billion pounds. Now, the total cost still at 1.2 billion pound, uh, there is sufficient for the scheme to wash its face. It makes a social profit. I should say it only just pays its way. For those who like benefit cost ratios, BCR, 1.08 is not considered a good return on investment over 60 years, and most projects reporting that would be rejected. But is that 955 billion that we need to look at closely? It's saying that the heritage benefit of 955 million by good fortune is bigger than the transport loss of 853 million. So how did they calculate a precise heritage, heritage benefit of 955 million pounds? Well, I'll tell you how they did it. They commissioned a survey which consisted of some face-to-face -face interviews with visitors, but mostly online surveys on the internet. You can compare them in a, in a way with voting in, intention surveys before a, an election as compared with actually having the election. Now, this survey asked people if they would, in principle, be willing to pay an increase in annual taxes over a three-year period to support the road scheme? If they said yes, they, there were questions about how much, and if they said no, the question was asked if the proposed road scheme would reduce their life satisfaction, and if so, how much would be the minimum they would accept in compensation for this reduction? It was made quite clear that they would not be asked actually to pay for this tax and they certainly wouldn't receive the compensation. It was explicitly hypothetical. It was the sort of question that no politician, of course, would dream of answering. Their standard approach is I don't answer hypothetical questions. But the public are much more amenable and most gave answers to these questions. There were separate answers for the visitors and for local drivers who were small in number. Uh, these are the, the figures are small and that's why the total amount they'd be prepared to have raised in taxes from them were small. But about half the people in the general population of the sample, that's um, uh, 1,159 individuals actually, said they would be willing to pay in principle an average of 14.41 pence per year, 14 pounds 41 pence per year for three years. And this was then multiplied by the adult population of 30.4 million, which comes to 1.2 billion in hypothetical tax revenue and it obviously includes people who were not expecting ever to visit the site, but uh, very praiseworthy, wanted to protect it. And this is then discounted back to 2010 prices 
to give the 955 million, which you remember was in the previous table. Now, I guess some of you are thinking that this is a somewhat suspect calculation. And it's true that there are serious criticisms, technical criticisms, and we can go into those if you want, but it was these criticisms which made the inspectors at the inquiry call the answers inherently uncertain. But bear with me because I want to still accept the calculations put forward by Highways England and say that we do not need to resolve those troubling objections for one key reason. Among the documents of the inquiry, actually 1500 documents of the inquiry, we now have another one, which is the most important of all, and that is the inspector's report. The examining authorities report is a statement of very considerable status in planning law. Legally, the Secretary of State can overrule its recommendations, subject to a number of conditions, but he does not rewrite it. This report is what the whole public examination is aimed at producing. And the examining authority concluded, you've heard before, that the scheme would substantially harm the integrity and the authenticity of the World Heritage Site, causing permanent irreversible damage, affecting not only our own, but also future generations. That's their conclusion. They go incidentally into considerable more detail, of course, of exactly how this is true. Now, my point is not whether the inspectors were right or wrong. It is that this statement itself, just the existence of this statement, profoundly changes the interpretation one can put on the estimate of the heritage value of the site. This is because the answers that were given were to hypothetical questions about how much people would be willing to pay in hypothetical taxes for a project which is predicated on the condition that it removed the site and sound of the road from the vicinity of Stonehenge and it was aimed at, at, at improvements achieved by the road scheme for both users and non-users of the World Heritage Site. It was a key component therefore of the overall cost-benefit analysis of the scheme and it's indeed key because the appraisal hangs by a thread on the confidence you have in this number. But this number, this extra value, is estimated by a procedure called contingent valuation. And the essential property of contingent valuation is that it is contingent. <clears throat> it depends on what information and what hypothetical conditions are offered to the respondent to hypothetical questions. Now we know what the answers were given about the question, would, what would you pay in taxes for a road scheme which was predicated on protecting Stonehenge for present and future generations? And the answer to that, that was about a billion pounds. At that date, the actual details of the scheme and its effects were not known. What respondents to the survey knew was that its promoters stated it would protect the World Heritage Site and they were showing willing to help in that. Now we know something more about the scheme that we didn't know before and they didn't know when they answered these questions. And that is the examiner's report. So we can make a mind experiment. Imagine that the question, instead of that first column, was the second column. How much would you be prepared to pay in taxes for a scheme which would cause irreparable long-term damage to the World Heritage Site 
for present and future generations. If you think that's too loaded, okay, reword it. How much would you be prepared to pay in taxes for a scheme that the planning inspectors had said that such damage would be caused? Now, the mind experiment is a simple question. Would that have made a significant and substantial difference to the results of the survey? Would it affect how you would answer those questions? Everybody in this field accepts that the values produced are sensitive to the way the question is presented. That's an essential feature of contingent valuation. Now, here is my judgment. It would certainly have reduced the reported willingness to pay by between 50% and 100%. And it would possibly have even reversed the willingness to pay and the willingness to accept compensation so that the heritage so-called benefit to insert into the benefit cost appraisal would actually have had to have a substantial negative value. So what I'm saying is that if you accept the entire rationale of the Highways England methodology and only add one element, which is a true statement about what the inspectors had concluded, then that way of framing the question would very su substantially change the answer. Now you might ask, who am I to say so? Is this not just another assertion about the future which is inherently uncertain and cannot be proved one way or another? Well, no, it's not, because it can be proved, what I've just said, easily, one way or the other, very simply by means of another survey. It would cost much less than the first, since it would not need all the setting up and design costs. All the other elements of the survey would stay the same. It's only the framing of the core question, giving respondents one more piece of information, factual information about what the inspectors had said. So my conclusion is that the work already done demonstrates that the scheme would not and could not provide transport benefits nearly equivalent to its cost. And I assert, on the basis of over 40 years engagement with road appraisal methods, that the method used to estimate heritage benefits carried out now would not be enough to make up the difference. Uh, make up the difference. And if that sounds arrogant, I say you don't have to believe me at all, because whether I'm right or wrong can be tested within a couple of months at the cost of a few thousand pounds. So what I'd say is let's do that <coughs> openly, transparently, with participation of both sides of the argument. We could ask the DFT's technical appraisal people and their advisors to be involved. I'd certainly volunteer, volunteer to be on the steering committee for an exercise like that. And I'm sure that dozens of other serious experts on both sides of the policy argument and neither would as well. Now, I want to be clear, all this would not resolve the wider quest problems of the UK's transport strategy and appraisal systems in a world of COVID and climate change. All of those problems still apply, but it does make a contribution to address this project because this project is unique in not even passing its promoter's own criteria. Uh, and I'll leave it for there and let's go. Thank you so much, Phil. Um, uh, again, kind of gobsmacking, jaw-dropping, heart-stopping demonstration of uh, why this scheme is, is a disgrace and why we've got to hope that, <coughs> that, the, uh, that it can be stopped. Um, Mike, are you there? Uh, Kate Fielden, are you there? Are you able to, to join us for... Yes, here we are. Yes. Brilliant. Um, Kate, are you... Don't know if she's there. Oh, she is there. I think she's coming. Thank Hello. you. Kate. Thank you. <laughs> um, so the hanging, I think hanging over this entire evening 
is the requirement that um, is imposed on all successful campaigns, which is to understand the thinking of the people that you are opposing. So we, we've got two questions really on that. One from Andy Winfield, who, who says, I mean, following up, Phil, on what you were saying, that the planning inspectors who examined the scheme recommended it, shouldn't go ahead. So why did the Transport Secretary approve it? Um, and then we've got one from, from Les Stringer again, um, following up from, from everything both of you have been saying. Why do you think this road is going ahead when the economic case for it is so weak? Uh, and, and that really is the question. Why, when, when the case against it, both in the archaeological and the transport considerations, is so weak, and when the government isn't exactly flush with money at the moment, and particularly after the huge amount that it's spent over the past year dealing with COVID, why is Grant Shapps, why is he given the, the green light? Do you think? I mean, obviously, I'm not expecting you to, to read his mind, but what, why, what do you think is going on here? Why is the government pressing ahead with this scheme? Shall I start? Yeah, you go, go for it, Phil. Um, I think the government is a bit taken aback because they didn't expect this response. They didn't expect the inspector's report. They didn't expect the amount of opposition, except in a sense, because anything involving heritage uh, is guaranteed to have op opposition. And I remember the uh, then director of roads in the, um, in the Department for Transport at a conference two years ago, saying how delighted the environmental lobby would be when it sees our recommendations on Stonehenge, because we will really prove that we're not just building roads for the sake of traffic, we're building for the sake of, of the environment. And maybe they actually believed this. I think it's only when you see the detail of it and you actually challenge and challenge it that you realize that's not how it worked out at all. Um, and the kindest interpretation, I think, is it's just a delay in coming to terms with what the most sensible of them realise is the new reality and that there's still something to be done. And so do you I'll, think it's... I'll, I'll stick to the kindest interpretation for the moment. Mm. Yeah. So in a sense, it's, it's akin to trying to turn an oil tanker, that it's once something like this has been set in motion, it becomes very difficult to stop. Um, but Phil, following on from your, you know, your being kind, to the government. Um, I, I guess that they operated on the assumption perhaps that th this would be welcomed and one of the reasons for that was that um, this scheme has received support from a number of quite prominent um, heritage agencies. So Mike perhaps if I can come to you with a question from Lena Martin. Why do you think Historic England, English Heritage and the National Trust are all in favour of the scheme? Mm. Well, um, as I mentioned in my talk, I, I was actually an inspector for, for English Heritage back in the late 80s when the scheme was proposed. And it was my old boss, Jeff Wainwright, in cahoots with uh, the then um, chairman of English Heritage, a man called Jocelyn Stevens. Uh, they got together with uh, their opposite numbers in, the, uh, uh, in um, highways and treasury to to get to set this scheme in motion and, and I, I think you're absolutely right about the the, the tanker with a, a, a or turning a circle i think i'd use the term juggernaut <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. uh, and, uh, uh, from that point um english heritage because of course at that point historic england had not split off from english heritage it was what they were one of the same organization was was basically one of the developers you know, uh, uh, carrying out this scheme. They were not an impartial uh, guardian of the heritage. They were seeing this as a development proposal to improve, um, as they saw it, the, um, the, the surroundings of Stonehenge. And of course, you know, that was, what is it, 40 years ago, nearly 40 years ago now? And of course, the, the amount we've learned about the quality and extent of the archaeology under the World Heritage Site has really thrown into doubt all of the assumptions that were initially made about the limited impact 
that uh, such a short tunnel would have. Uh, but of course, it was too late. They'd already signed up. Uh, initially, the National Trust weren't happy. And somewhere around 2004, we had a uh, public uh, inquiry in Salisbury about uh, the draft proposal. And uh, they indeed were initially against it. And they were only turned round when the scheme, the tunnel was enlarged slightly so that it no longer uh, would leave the, the avenue, the Stonehenge Avenue, cut in two. Uh, but again, I don't think they took on board the fact that there's an awful lot of extremely high quality archaeology outside of the, of the portals uh, because they really shouldn't be uh, advocating that level of destruction. Kate, do you have any anything to add on? Well, I can only say, Tom, that, that um, it seems to be a very strong political impetus to get this scheme through. Um, the Prime Minister talks about um, increasing infrastructure and so on. It's a big move to, to um, reach out to the regions and so on without giving thought to the detail. And what has always concerned me in this is the lack of interest in the scheme by um, the Secretary of State for, for Heritage. You know? And um, it, it's almost as though it's been hived off as a, a political aim and never mind the detail. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, two sides of the Prime Minister's character, one, an lo absolute love of infrastructure projects and another, a, a, a love of ancient history. And it's a shame that his love of infrastructure projects has conquered yeah. the love of ancient history, but there you go. Um, so I think all of you, both of you have touched on the fact that, um, of course, this is not just an issue for, for Britain. Um, this is an iconic world heritage site. So um, we've got a question from Martin Collier, focusing on the international aspect, that we're told UNESCO is opposed to the road scheme. Should the government take any notice of UNESCO? I mean, I'm guessing that you think that they should. Um, but we also have a question uh, that's come in on the, the Q&As from Lisa Quattromini. Um, it's astonishing that this is even under discussion. Imagine the uproar if the pyramids or Machu Picchu were being tarmacked over. Presumably all giving credence and support to this scheme, abdicate any authority to dictate what happens with other World Heritage sites. And Mike, looking at the map that you gave of the World Heritage site and the sense that um, development is encroaching in on the boundaries, and I thought immediately of um, the development that's happening at Giza, the way that that's closing in on the pyramids there, which is mentioned by Lisa, but also um, you know, uh, the sense you have with um, particular areas of, of ecosystem where they end up islands surrounded by development and effectively therefore kind of doomed to extinction. Essentially that is the risk that is faced here, isn't it? And it's a danger for world heritage sites across the world, firstly because the Stonehenge landscape is so iconic, it's one of the most famous globally, and secondly because Britain is a wealthy country and if we can't afford to do this, then what hope for countries that don't have the financial resources that we do? Uh, would you agree that this is something that, you know, ha absolutely has an international dimension? It, it sets an appalling example, because for, for those that are less well off, it, it just offers the, the get out clause to say, well, if the UK can't be bothered with their bit of world's heritage then nor can we and uh, yes i'm afraid we lose all moral authority in trying to, uh, to to preserve not just our sites but everybody you know to help help with everybody else's so um now it, it's uh, we we have to to aim to work as a world community when it comes to preserving global heritage and uh, if we're seen to be falling down on that i, I think um yeah, it's uh, it, it's the big it, it's potentially the beginning of the end for those kinds of cooperative uh, visions and, and approaches that are so essential. Phil, do you place it in yeah. a national context? Um, I'd go along with that. I'd perhaps add one sort of insight, precisely because I'm not an archaeologist. And for most of my life, I've thought I was interested in heritage, 
I really had a very narrow idea about what heritage meant. And I'm sure like many other people, I thought of Stonehenge as a group of very interesting stones. And that was it. There wasn't, it, it wasn't anything else. Mm. And um, I really quite find it very remarkable that the quality of television coverage of archaeology now, in the last, say, five years, has dramatically transformed the awareness of ignorant people like me about what archaeology really means. And this, the, the work to understand what, that what's happening underneath there that we don't know yet mm. is so much as important or even more important than the group of stones. The group of stones are a, are a, a flag saying, uh, look under here. And it's a no isn't it? Mm. Um, Kate, you, you've had a lot of dealings with UNESCO over this. What's your sense of the current situation with them? I think that they are deeply concerned and for the reasons which have been explained by, by Mike and Phil. And of course the UK is in a, in a bad way in caring for its World Heritage Sites. Um, Liverpool uh, uh, Maritime Mercantile City is on the list of World Heritage in Danger. And it is just possible that it will be removed from the World Heritage <coughs> list because of um, development proposals. We don't know whether Stonehenge is going to be put on the list of World Heritage in Danger, given that UNESCO has advised several times that the scheme shouldn't go ahead. Um, we've also got, of course, that the Houses of Parliament, which are in a parlous state and, and the repairs keep being put off, or the major repairs that are needed, and that's another worry for UNESCO. And I think, just as Mike was saying, it's such a poor example for countries who do care for their world heritage sites and want the best for, all, for them, but have political pressures to increase tourism and to, to provide infrastructure and so on. And it's one would have thought it would be a more difficult fight for them to preserve their world heritage sites, where for us it ought to be easy, but it just doesn't seem to be. Okay. Um, a, a, a question, this is, I think, really for Mike, um, from Jane Sarson, splendidly named Sarson Royal. Um, if anything is found of historical interest, will the project be halted? I mean, I'm assuming it's absolutely, of course, material, something of historical um, interest will be found. But, um, I mean, the, the, the discovery of the, um, of, the, of the circle last summer was unexpected, doesn't seem to have halted the, the development. What if something of a comparable scale directly on the route is found? Would that serve to halt the project, do you think? Probably not, I guess. But No, no they, they would carry on regardless. I mean, there are various features out there in that landscape which are truly extraordinary. And the, the last summer's discovery of these enormous pits, about 20 metres in diameter, at least five meters deep and what some 20 of them basically forming a circle around the great henge of Darrington walls uh, totally undreamed of unexpected um, but then uh, we started to think well hang on a moment there's a really extraordinary feature just south of the road line of this of the western portal that's called the Wilsford shaft and uh, it was thought to be a bronze age round barrow when it was first, uh, when, when uh, it was excavated in the 1960s. And uh, they found that actually it, it was sitting on top of a big hole and they went down and down and down and 30 meters later, they finally hit the bottom, 30 meters. Now, is it alone in that landscape? Our geophysics colleagues, uh, Chris Gaffney and uh, Vince Gaffney and their um, uh, hidden Stonehenge landscape project, they reckon there are lots of these. Some of them are natural solution hollows, and in fact one was encountered just outside the road line uh, by uh, uh, 
uh, highways uh, contractors uh, while evaluating the Western uh, portal. And um, we don't know if that was actually a solution hollow or another of these constructed features. Now, they may be wells, but why dig a well from the very top of the chalk when you can just pop down to the river? They may have had some sacred uh, significance. But the point is that if you actually are digging a tunnel, less than 30, uh, those points where it's less than 30 meters um, below the ground surface, what happens if you hit one of those? Is there really any chance of excavating it? I don't think so. I think on grounds of health and safety, they would just have to blitz their way through it and maybe make sure that nobody knew they'd done it. Right, yes. Okay, well, I, so it does seem to me that the argument against it from the archaeological point of view is, I mean, it, it seems to me irrefutable. Um, and in a sense, therefore, I suppose once that's accepted, it, it, the issue for people who may not be archaeologists, who may not have a, a passionate interest in prehistory, becomes um, what about the pollution? What about the congestion? What about the rat runs that the, um, the current narrow condition of the A303 presents? So uh, in all fairness, I must ask a question from Janice Hassett, uh, and I guess this is primarily aimed at Phil. Traffic congestion and the volume of vehicles seeking alternative routes to the A303 is ruining the quality of life in villages close to Stonehenge. What strategic options does Highways England have to address this other than the tunnel? Um, <clears throat> I would say that the strategic options to address this are not primarily those which are open to Highways England in its current brief. I mean, you could have a different brief given to Highways England, but that's, that's for a different day. The strategic options are those by government, both local and national. And I think this is absolutely salient now because uh, if the traffic forecasts are right of unending increases in traffic flows, uh, traffic demand, for decades and decades into the future, the entire forecasting horizon that transport planners think is possible. If they are right, then the scale of congestion cannot be solved by any conceivable road building project, because you cannot build roads as quickly as the forecast increases in, uh, in traffic, even if you wanted to. Uh, it would be devastating if you tried, but it's still not going to be solved. And the outcome of that sort of strategic approach is not that congestion will get better and better, but that congestion will get worse and worse more slowly than it otherwise might have been. And it seems to me there is only one strategic long-term view which makes sense in the modern world, and especially one coping with carbon, uh, and that is to plan for and achieve reductions in traffic volume rather than providing for increases. And the funny thing is, parts of government uh, policy do indeed say that. The Secretary of State has said we must learn to use our uh, uh, cars less and walk cycle, use public transport more. It's quite unambiguous, it's a very praiseworthy objective. It's just incompatible with the idea that you at, at the same time cater and cope, uh, cater by providing road space to cope with increases in traffic. And there's a real dilemma there, I think. It's a fault line in the, strategic, in the government strategic thinking, which is trying to do the right thing and it's trying to do the wrong thing, both at the same time, in the illusion that that way you please everybody. And I think the outcome is that you please nobody. It's simply not going to work. I mean, I do feel that both in villages in the, in the country and residential areas in the city are devastated by uh, 
unending increases in traffic volume. And the idea that this is the time when small petrol private cars are simply being replaced by double the size SUVs uh, uh, is completely the wrong approach. To it. That, that simply is making things worse, not better. And, and Mike, as someone who deals with um, landscape, thinking of it in terms not just of centuries, but, but of millennia, um, how do you feel personally that this, of what's going to happen to this landscape mm -hmm. simply because of uncertainty around what transport developments there will be over the next 10 years, 20 years? Uh, I mean, just thinking about world history in global terms, you know, what, what, one of the things that fascinates me about archaeology is it is watching the exponential growth across the planet of all manner of aspects of population, land use, resource exhaustion, and um, you know, what we have seen in microcosm really, and what we are seeing in that landscape is this sense that uh, we, we are in danger of losing the very thing that we cherish to help us understand our place in world history, uh, our places as humans uh, and, and you know, where we've come from and where we're going. Uh, it's just going to, it's just falling victim to the very forces that we are trying to understand, and uh, not just as archaeologists, but uh, well as people everywhere, to try yeah. and make sense of our lives and control the, um, the, the 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 headlong rush towards what appears to be you know near total disaster. <laughs> <laughs> well, you heard it here first, folks. Climate change. Um, Yes, climate change. I mean, I mean I, absolutely, because, because what's disorienting about this whole issue is that on the one hand, I think it's entirely legitimate to talk in you know, sweeping terms. We're talking in terms of, of millennia. We're talking in terms of the future of the planet. These are the scale of the issues that are involved. But equally, of course, these are very, very local issues as well. And Kate, as someone who is local, um, who's had a lot of uh, dealings with different opinions on this um, you know, in South Wiltshire, What's your sense of the balance of opinion and, and the way that the pendulum on this is swinging? It's a difficult issue and there's no getting away from it that local villages are suffering from rat running. Um, I feel very strongly that they've been neglected by the local authority who could have in, implemented traffic calming measures to prevent a serious rat running limits on weight limits on large vehicles, um, speed limits, um, sweeping policemen or whatever it takes. Uh, um, there could be ways of managing the, the, the traffic flow that would discourage people from using the alternative routes. I'm not sure that widening the road and putting in the tunnel will actually solve the problem for those villages partly because of what Phil has said, but also because the tunnel will be closed from time to time and maybe even with accidents. And when that happens, all the traffic, at least one way, will go through the rat runs. Furthermore, there will be people who can easily and will wish to avoid the tunnel and they will use the local roads instead of the A303. Um, there will be five years or so, or there would be if the scheme goes ahead, of total disruption for local people. Absolute nightmare. One wouldn't wish it on anybody. I don't know whether they would consider it worth it in the end, the disruption and, and the dust and the discomfort, the traffic jams and so on. Also wondering about the situation for the visitors who, who for five years will be travelling through all these roadworks to the visitor centre and then ultimately visiting a world heritage site and the first thing they see of it more or less will be um, the visitor centre instead of that wonderful view from the A303 of the, of the stones as we go past. Right well we, there is actually um, uh, a question, um, let me see if I can find it, uh, I can't remember who called it, but, but essentially it was how important is it that um, 
people are able to see the stones from, from the road or, or should that not be a consideration should should getting rid of the road be a priority well, if you ask me, I'm very interested. Oh, sorry. <laughs> hey, sorry, Phil. Uh, yeah, just kick off with that. Answer well, your views on well, that. Since I raised it, um, I think it's very important indeed. It, for many people, it's the only view they, they have of Stonehenge. It's a landmark, as indeed it was presumably designed to be in the first place. It's a landmark for people travelling towards it. And and uh, um, it's a very special thing in the, in the psyche of, of, of our nation. And of the world, of course, we're lucky enough to see it on a regular basis, but, but others make pilgrimages from all over the world to see it. It's terribly important. Mike, would you, would you agree as an archaeologist who must know it better, yes, more, better than anyone? I, I, I think uh, just in my lifetime, I've seen Stonehenge being turned increasingly in, uh, into a privatised revenue stream. Um, just before I joined English Heritage, uh, 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 you know, it was the government that managed Stonehenge on behalf of the people of Britain. It was something for all of us to share. Uh, English Heritage was formed and uh, it, as a quango, it was still quasi-autonomous. But of course, what's happened with its separation from historic England recently, is it's basically been turned into a private company there to make money and Stonehenge is its main source of revenue. And so do you think that's a major reason why they're backing the, the scheme? I, I, think, I, I don't think necessarily a major reason, but I think it's just a long-term process that we're seeing. And you know, in a way, you know, the ir irony is that the, the final effect of privatisation is that you will, will only be able to see Stonehenge if you pay £15.50 to this, this, this company basically, uh, and remember it was given to the nation by Cecil Chubb all those years ago. So uh, yeah, I, I think it's a terrible shame. And I think uh, millions of people are stunned when they discover that actually you won't be able to see the site for free. I mean, you, you know, the only way you can do that is you can access it along the various public byways which English Heritage sought to close recently, but uh, were told that it would take an act of parliament and they weren't going to be allowed because it contravened people's rights uh, of, of use of the countryside. Um, but uh, uh, if you do use those byways, if you get anywhere near Stonehenge, you will be challenged and you will be asked if you actually have a ticket to visit and then turned away. So yes, I think it's a retrograde step. Uh, Terrible thing to happen. And, and Phil? Just to add, uh, well, to add one point to that, there is, there's an irony, really, about the, um, the A303 proposal to reduce congestion, because as it turns out, one of the causes of congestion in the neighbourhood of, of Stonehenge is precisely motorists slowing down so that they can uh, they can get a better look at Stonehenge as a sort yeah. of mobile yeah. viewing I, gallery. Can I just pause there because there's a question from Andrew Nicholson who, who touches on exactly that. Um, Project Director Derek Parody, great name, has responded by effectively saying well that's as maybe we have a higher objective the continuous mile a minute expressway to and from the southwest. What's your take on the rubber necking phenomenon? What's the best answer to the Project Director well, the transport and roads policy? So that is obviously an issue, isn't it? Yes, um, it, it is an issue. And if one's going to take the view that it is an essential human right to be able to see this important monument free, then that is incompatible with putting, um, with, uh, with, uh, putting the traffic in a tunnel. And it's, uh, and it's also incompatible with having um, no congestion in the neighbourhood if you do it by car, because it is true, it seems, that, um, uh, as Andrew Nicholson has pointed out, that uh, the characteristics of, con of congestion in the neighbourhood of Stonehenge are remarkably connected with the times of daylight and twilight and 
and dark is a traffic pass thing and it's only when there's light that people do this now if if you're going to allow that then you're going to have congestion and you just simply have to say well maybe the view is more important than the uh, than than the congestion what i'd say is what a tragedy it is if the price of a view to stonehenge is that you have to own a car I mean, this is not, uh, uh, if, if this is a right, it's not a right that should be confined to those who have cars. It's one that there ought to be deliberate viewing galleries at a distance uh, or whatever, and, and public transport methods of getting there so that people do have the opportunity to, uh, to, to, to take that pleasure. But it seems that, that People want it always. You know, they can't. You can't have everything here. Yeah. Well, and the National Trust, of course, owns a substantial amount of the uh, the landscape from which the viewing would be possible, uh, which may be another <laughs> another part of the equation. Um, I think we've got two more questions, both of them fairly hefty ones. Um, so, all th for all three of you. Um, the first one is um, from Christine Wheeler, and in a way, it's it's the question that's been hanging over everything that everyone's been saying this evening. And it's very simply, what would you like the government to do about the road scheme? And obviously, perhaps cancel it. But what would you like to put in its place? Just the status quo? What? What? Who wants to go first with that, <laughs> Phil? Well. Uh... I know that there are other options which have been offered. One is simply to make a longer route. Uh, uh, it would obviously cost much more if it was a longer tunnel. It would probably cost less if it was a if it was surface. It's a way of getting some of those advantages without some of the disadvantages. At the other extreme, one can say that the um, uh, that. Uh, sound barriers uh, to to stop the uh, the noise of traffic getting as far as Stonehenge would do quite a lot at very little cost in, indeed to, um, to to get some of the benefits. Don't think there's an easy uh, an easy answer as long as one's providing for for everlasting traffic growth. I think you know it's one of those things that we have to grapple with the big picture, uh, not only the, the local details. The whole prospect of, um, uh, the whole argument for the A303 is that it only would make sense if you build the entire A303 improvements all the way down to the West Country. And that seems very unlikely. So all that the, the present scheme would do is uh, without all those other advantages, is simply move bottlenecks uh, uh, a mile or two miles down the road to the next bottleneck, and then then we've just wasted money. Well, that's the really shocking thing, isn't it? Uh, that was in uh, Kate Freeman's presentation. That you know, even if you even if you build the tunnel, the odds are that you'll then get stuck behind a tractor, you know, three miles on, and there's no plan to to ease that. Um, Mike, what what what? I remember when we we made a little film together for the yes. Stonehenge Alliance, and the first thing you said was, "Well, the tunnel's too short." Does that imply that you'd like mean imply that you'd like to just see a longer tunnel? Well, th there are two alternatives. One of them is the longer tunnel. The other is the surface southern route. And uh, you know, ha having read the report that Highways put out about why they didn't like the southern route, I just couldn't understand why they thought a series of fairly low-level regional and local um, uh, uh, um, impediments really came anywhere close to a major international impediment um, and I wonder if it's actually more to do with who owns that land there's various parcels of land and what political clout they may have um, yeah. so, uh, uh, as to why they were so reluctant uh, and, and very strange things were said by archaeologists in favour of the tunnel to say that there were important archaeological constraints about the southern route. No, there aren't. There's nothing ever been recorded from along that road line. So what's going? what was going on for people to, to actually make bogus claims like that? People who, who, who are professional and who we rely on being honest. 
So I, I was very surprised about that. Um, but, you know, I, I, uh, I've always thought that whatever the route improvement is, you're just shifting the traffic jam another 10 miles down the road. I've sat in that jam many times. Yeah. In a, in, I know exactly that once I'm out beyond Winterbourne Stoke heading west, we're going to hit another jam. And of course, those jams are going to be backing up through the tunnel uh, uh, for, for people in the year 2035 and thereafter. So, uh, no, there's no simple answer to this one, but we are living at a crisis, a key moment in human history, which is to do with our awareness of climate change and our use of resources and our relationship to roads and how we use them and public and private transport, I think really is going to have to change if our species is to continue to thrive as we have. Um, I, I've got a, a question from Andy Ryan Tart, former Mayor of Amesbury, Chair of Salisbury Chambers of Commerce, a, a great enthusiast for um, building a, 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 route, a ring road um, further south. Mm. Um, he's actually just sent a, a, a point, I'll, I'll make it a point, because we're running out of time, it's a question I want to ask Kate to end with. Peter says, when the Atropos family sold the site to Cecil Chubb in 1915, they placed restrictive covenants preventing anything being built within 400 yards of Triangle Field. Um, these 1915 covenants are still extant, they have not been extinguished and are in the public interest. How are the government intending to overcome, overcome them? They say they are missing, but they aren't. Um, I have no idea about that, but the idea that um, a 1915 covenant might come <laughs> galloping to the rescue is one that I'm going to cling to. Right, we are almost running out of time and there's one last question that I want to put to Kate, whose heroic efforts um, with the other Kate, as I say, you know, women called Kate have just completely taken the lead in, in everything that's being done to stop this terrible scheme. Kate Fielden, um, there's a question from Tanya Staple. How can pressure be brought to bear on the government to rethink this scheme? So I'm going to just slightly elaborate on that. What can people do, people who may be listening here, to help? What do we need, basically? Uh, money, support, letters to MPs, what? Well, <laughs> I think... Um... First of all, they, they, it would be wonderful if more people were to write to their own MPs, copy to the Prime Minister, to the Transport Secretary, and also to sign our petition, which has, as, as you know, over 200,000 signatures already that ought to bring some pressure to bear on the government. And of course, at the moment, as you, you, you will also know, there is pending a, a high court hearing a challenge to the decision by the Secretary of State on this road yes. scheme. And so that um, opens on Wednesday, uh, a fortnight on Wednesday? Yes. So just under two and, weeks. And, and so Kate's very kindly, or someone's very kindly put up the list of things that can be done. Oh, if you need not, um, further information about this, you can find all the addresses and hints and so on on our Save Stonehenge, well, uh, Stonehenge, Stonehenge, Stonehenge Alliance. Dot org. Dot uk uh, website. Thank you, Kate. Um, <laughs> I, I oh, mean, yeah. I a, there's a bit of a hole. I, I don't know whether I, I, I can share the screen. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> I had a little little thing. Well, I mean, the, 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 your heroism is not least in that you volunteered to try and wrestle with putting up this final PowerPoint thing, because I ducked the challenge, like the coward that I am. Um, well, maybe it might be, uh, the, web, the website address did just go up. I it, don't know whether everyone can see it. Sorry, I'll, I'll it, try it, again. It, uh, but essentially the details, anyone out there who wants to help Google Stonehenge Alliance, it will go straight to that site. It, there are all kinds of information there. Um, and as you said, um, this appeal that's going through it's going to cost £80,000. We've got a fair whack of that, but we haven't got all of it. So anyone who would like to help out with that, please, please do so. Um, and there is also the, the possibility of going to appeal after that or having to defend a government appeal. Um, so I, I guess that's certainly one way to do it. Write to your MPs, um, uh, sign petitions, um, just talk about it because, uh, you know, this is a 
I think you will, I hope, agree, having heard um, the very distinguished people talking about this tonight, that this is a terrible thing. And my personal feeling is that um, I talked to uh, somebody who knows the workings of government, knows the workings of Whitehall, and I said, why, why is this going on? And um, he said, essentially, the British economy has been so blitzed by COVID that the Keynesian response is essentially you dig a hole, you shove it full of money, and then you bury it. And that's pretty much what the Stonehenge Tunnel is. It seems to me that this is sacrifice, sacrificing a, a, a landscape that you measure in terms of millennia, in terms of very, very short term, essentially political needs. Uh, and so that's why I think not just for um, the good of now, but for the good of future generations. This is absolutely a fight that we should all be rallying around. So I can't thank you out there enough for, for turning up and for, for listening to us, for supporting us, for any future help that you may give. Uh, I can't, I, I would like to thank um, uh, Mike. I would like to thank Phil. I would like to thank the two Kates. Uh, I would like to thank everyone else uh, behind the scenes who has helped with this. Um, and, you know, let's, let's keep our fingers crossed for a good result um, on the 23rd or whenever it is that the ruling will come in. Uh, and I bid you all a very good evening. Thanks very much.